So we've been talking off the cuffs. Now we're back to it. I mean, we're going to go back over who you are. I mean, if they don't know who you are, once I show some of these links, to be honest with you, man, it's like a Picasso type thing. Like looking at some of your stuff, like really, to be fully honest with you, Mr. Greg, like when the, the thing that really made me fall in love with your paintings is that when I looked the detail that you would do, and it said on, I forget exactly what painting it is, and I can't believe I'm calling myself out, but it was, I was, I was reading a clip and we talked about how you're a visual historian. Right? right. And then it was like you even go into the detail about like you were just saying about the jerseys, the kind of wool it was, what kind of day it was. So maybe this would be, you know, the, the wool would be extracted just a little bit because of the moisture in the thing. Right. Can you is there any way you can just in, indulge a little bit on how long do you prepare? Like how long is your recon is your is your your research process for one of these paintings? Uh, that's a great question. It's actually it, it it varies like from subject to subject. But uh uh, you know, some of them are quicker than others. Some of them can take a couple of days or a week or so, but others can take months, many months, you know, because uh, some of the information that I look for just isn't necessarily out there. You know, that's it's not easy to find. So I have to go digging through, uh, you know, 100-year-old newspapers. And it's like, first, I have to find an archive of said 100-year-old newspapers <laughs> right. uh, and, you know, just hope that I find the kind of information that I need. Uh, so it's, it, it just varies from, from painting to painting, but, you know, that's, that's part of the fun. Uh, I love, you know, reading up on this stuff and kind of trying to build up like a, a knowledge base of, of what these jerseys looked like, what these players looked like, what the ballparks looked like. That's like, you know, the fact that, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing enough that people pay for my work, but the fact that like they're paying for me to paint for them and to like do research like that. I mean, that's the best. No, oh, absolutely, man. And, and definitely it's a painting to last and to, to pass through generations and everything like that for sure. Now, hopefully <laughs> off the cusp, how many paintings have you done? Do you remember? Um, so if I've, if I include like all of the little, um, uh, color studies that I do. They're like these little five by seven kind of preparatory sketches. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm probably in the, oh my God, I, I think I might be like in the 700 range, like over the past 15 years or so. So when you say like the prep, like basically like, mm -hmm. uh, like as a writer would have like a first draft, a second draft, uh, a final rough and then an edit. Yeah. Rough. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's like the color study kind of, you know, it, it, you know, it plots out exactly what you're going to do in that final piece. It's like the skeleton of, of the final piece. So it's like just as important, same exact thing. And I hope I don't come off like sounding ignorant or anything like that to your, you, you know, your profession. I just want to make sure if someone's never even thought about an oil or an easel painting, or they can listen and, and just have it, you know, not for a pun for words, but painted out and everything like that right now. <laughs> yeah. Bachelors and masters in arts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bachelor. So bachelors in, uh, I guess it's a bachelor in fine art, fine art with a, a major in uh, illustration, if I remember. And the master's is actually in uh, in art education, but uh, I ended up uh, not really using it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, well, so like you said, though, you do a lot of history as well, too. So we can also say that you're a historian in your paintings, like you say, a visual historian. So you are teaching. You are. Fair. Just, just, hey, look, listen, I'm, I'm from the peanut gallery, but I'm throwing the peanuts at them, not at you. So. I will take that. I appreciate okay. it. Now, let me ask you this question from Brooklyn, right? So, yeah. Yankees or Mets? Oh, man. All right. So, here's the thing. Here we I, go. <laughs> I, I, I'm a Yankee fan. I grew up a Yankee fan, but I'm not, uh, I, I like to think that I'm not like a, like a, I don't know, like a Over snotty Yankee fan. Yeah, right. I mean, I love the Mets too. I just, I love baseball. I have no problem going to City Field and, and watching the Mets. I actually, I think the kind of baseball that I like watching is more of a National League ball anyway, like small ball. Yeah. And usually the Yankees just kind of piss me off, you know, because uh, you get a man on base and you just kind of Sorry, try to hit a 20 run home run or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. let, me, let me ask you this question. Well, not really a question. I'm going to read a quote to you. Sure, sure. And, and, and maybe you know who said it, and maybe you can just go on a little bit about it. No other in sport embodies the relationship between generations and the sense of community like baseball. Do you remember when you said that? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think that might even be on my website now that I think about it. 
It, it is. It is. It was also, you said it was, it was one of your, a, um, I want to say your acceptance speeches when you won an award. And uh, you also, I want to say, believe you said that, but either or, no matter when you said it, you said it. And, and it, it is, it is something big. Like we were talking about the jerseys, like your paintings, like for the grandchild to come over and see a painting of, let's say, I'm just going to say Ty Cobb and the grandfather to tell him about how the split hand was and the knuckle to knuckle in the bat. And really it's, it's a passion of error and history and generations and everything like that. And I, and I bring you all to say this because it is a generation gap because you can love a ball player that you've never seen play before. You've never right. seen do anything of that. So my question to you is after saying that, who is your favorite baseball player of all time and your favorite era of baseball of all time? Okay. Um, I kind of have two favorites that I, I trade off of each other. So I love, I love Lou Gehrig. Um, just kind of, you know, knowing, <clears throat> obviously knowing about him and, and knowing about the disease that, uh, that he contracted, but also knowing that, you know, in terms of, uh, the quality of, uh, player that he was, you know, certainly one of the best players of all time. And, uh, and I think a lot of people kind of forget that he was one of the best players of all time, just because I think they remember that speech, um, but, you know, in addition to that, you know, the quality of his character is also very appealing to me. Uh, I also really love uh, Carl Hubble, mm. uh, who uh, was a pitcher for the uh, for the Giants in the uh, late twenties and thirties uh, and early forties. Um, he he was a Hall of Famer also, and he was he was a you know big game pitcher. Um, and I I think I just really I kind of fell in love with him when I read. Uh, there's a book that Red Barber put out or was published. Uh, that was one of Red Barber's books. Uh, I don't know, maybe in the early eighties uh, called walk in the spirit. And there's this whole chapter about Hubble and about how he kind of learned to compose himself while playing. Um, and you know how, like if you would, you know, throw a pitch or whatever and the batter hits it and his shortstop or whatever makes an error. Uh, you know, he learned to kind of control like a temper, you know, he wouldn't get mad at, uh, at the shortstop. He would kind of just say, okay, well this happened. So now how do we adapt? You know, how do we, uh, how do we pull through? How do we get this next out or whatever? So I think he kind of just, you know, somehow developed like ice water in his veins. Um, and, you know, he was like spiritually, it just seemed like he was very much there. Um, and I know Red Barber said um, that I think he was quoted as saying something to the effect of, you know, if he if there had to be, you know, one ball game pitched and his life was on the balance that he wanted Carl Hubble to pitch it. And I just like something about that. Just like, OK, that's my guy. Um, so I kind of think that kind of goes in line with the kind of like the era that I'm most interested in. It's usually kind of stuff around the depression era, you know, the thirties and, and then even a little bit before the war, uh, you know, when Gehrig and Hubble were, were kind of stars. Uh, and I think it has a lot to do with my grandfather, uh, my grandfather, my, uh, my dad's dad, who uh, he passed away when I was young, uh, but he was a big New York giants fan. And I never really got to talk to him about baseball because I think I kind of got into it much later, but I kind of always had this, uh, I had this vision of him, you know, like in my, in my twenties, when I started painting this stuff, mm -hmm. I had a vision of him kind of being the same age as I was like going to the polo grounds and seeing Carl Hubble and seeing Mel Ott and, 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 you know, Dick Bartell and people like that. And you know, I imagined him maybe being at the 1936, 37 World Series, seeing the Giants face the Yankees. And for whatever reason, that just it just really appealed to me. It's like I was able to connect with him through that, even though I have no idea if he went to any of those games. Right, I'm right, sure right. that those guys were his heroes. But it, yeah, it's just kind of it, it's just part of that whole generational thing that, that baseball is so special with. No, that's a great, that's, that's definitely a great story and definitely paints a picture, no pun intended, but it definitely, the same thing with my, uh, my family grew up in the Bronx, uh, you know, hot dogs in front of Yankee stadium and everything like that. Anytime uh, I grew up in Baltimore and it's just funny, I'll just add on with your story about Luke Gehrig. Anytime anyone would bring up the street, I even have, 
I even have the soda. I still have the same soda. <laughs> That's from awesome. When, nice. From when Cal broke the when broke the record. That's and, awesome. And, and my father though would destroy me. Every, he's from Pittsburgh. Okay. He would say one, they played at night. Right. Two, the jerseys can breathe. Three, they never took they they rode the iron horse. Right. They, they literally took the trains. He would like don't talk to me. They played double headers in the. So it would always be the comparisons about how much tougher the people were back then, and and just and just how much just more grit and more passion because you weren't getting paid the millions of dollars. A lot of them had to go back to the coal mines or the steel mills and stuff like that. So I heard you say also around your you know in your early twenties is when you started painting and feeling the connection would would that be fair to say your calling better yet to say your forte is when you figured out this is what mr greg's going to do right here this is my connection this is my passion this is my gift to the world yeah i mean i so i i went to art school in in manhattan and like my intention was to be like a, a science fiction fantasy book cover illustrator you know i was i liked baseball and i kind of had always liked it when i was young but uh, I, you know, at that point I was just kind of into that kind of imagery and I was in school for a few years and I was working towards that. And it just, you know, I, I did these paintings that were kind of geared towards that kind of portfolio, but they, I didn't love doing them. And I felt like I didn't love them as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it wasn't until my, my senior year in, uh, in the art school that I did, like my first, you know, mature uh, baseball piece. And I did that and like everything about it was, it was just playing, you know, it was just fun and something, it felt right. You know, it tugged on the proper heartstrings and, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I want to, I want to ride this out. I want to see if I can do another one. You know, if I, if I enjoy it just as much and I ended up over the next few years, I ended up doing a couple more here and there and it was like the same thing. I just, I loved it and loved it and loved it. And I, I guess I, I just realized that that was what, you know, that was kind of what I was supposed to do with, uh, with my art. Uh, you know, not, I didn't know if it was what I was going to be doing, you know, 20 years from now. I mean, it kind of developed into that where it's like, I can't imagine doing anything else. Um and I don't, I don't want to do anything else. Uh, no, and, and as a lover, not to cut you off, a lover hmm. of your work, please don't do anything. But <laughs> Thank go, you. Go, go, go back to it. I'm sorry to cut you off. I just no, 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 no worries. Yeah, I, I just, I don't, I mean, I, I had no desire to do, you know, landscapes or portraiture or still lifes or like any abstracts or anything like that. Like, this is kind of where, this is where my heart is. And it, I just, I want to stay here. And if I can continue to make a living, you know, off of it, God willing, uh, then I'm just going to keep on doing it. Uh, it's just, I, it, it's definitely what I'm here for. It's definitely what I'm supposed to be doing. No, no, no. Good for you. And good for us, the people that get to see it as well. I mean, and, and, and it's great to hear that story about how you know, you spun off, you went, you did your thing, multiple awards, one Norman Rockwell Museum Award, that's huge. You have your paintings hanging in the Yogi Bear Museum, Bob Feller Museum, probably multiple, multiple more. You, I mean, the stamps play ball. Now, let me ask you about the stamps collection. Were those 12, were those your, did you personally pick them or did they present them and say, hey, these are the ones we want to use licensing in the third and the fourth? So what's interesting is that the, the post office, they contacted me and they didn't want to use any of my work on the actual stamps. Like they didn't want to commission me to do work for the stamps because, you know, though they already have a lot of baseball stamps that, have, that they've done over the past 30, 40 years, however many. And they just wanted to kind of put a booklet together and they wanted my work in the booklet, which was cool. You know, I'm totally, I'm down for that. Uh, but I haven't, you know, I haven't made the jump yet to being on a, a postage stamp myself, but that, I mean, that would be amazing um, if that would ever happen. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of, it's an honor. Like I don't, I don't, I don't regularly get, uh, I don't regularly get a lot of commercial work mm -hmm. because I just kind of stick to the private sector where I'm just kind of doing commission work, you know, for, for people. And it's like, you know, they'll, they'll be interested in something of Mickey Mantle and I'll do a painting of Mickey Mantle for them. And then it goes into their collection and it's like, 
you know, no one ever sees it. Uh, And, you know, you do that over and over again over the course of a few years, you know, every now and then it's like doing a thing for the postal service or doing, you know, a book cover here or there. It's like, that's fun stuff and it's cool and it's special. It just, it means like it, it, I don't want to say it like legitimizes what I'm doing, but maybe it validates it in some way that maybe, you know, the people who are commissioning me aren't completely crazy. Right. Like maybe, maybe these right. other people think that other people would like the work. Right. No, so, some, I mean, just some of the work like uh, Bob, Mr. Bob, Robert Kendrick out in the uh, Negro league baseball museum. I know he's a huge fan of yours. Uh, oh. that, that's really where I was turned on to you is just seeing the, the, the paintings and the paintings. Now, let me ask you this. I see that you have a lot of obscure, like not a lot of you know, modern day. It's all old. Who is your favorite when painting them? Right. So I'm just saying, for instance, okay, you're doing Clemente. Then you found out all these things while doing your research on Clemente. And you're like, okay, I have a different admiration, a different respect for this ball player. For Mr. Greg, who was that person that you were like, oh, okay, I'll do this. It's not a problem. It's not. And then really at the end of the day, it was like your Kevin Costner, if you paint it, you will believe type moment. And now that's your guy (laughs) type thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there can be more than one. So I don't want to make it, I don't want to make it narrowed <laughs> down. You know, there can be more than one. No, you know what it is? So there are a lot of them. The thing is, when I did, uh, when I did a lot of the paintings for the, uh, the show that was at the, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum uh, last year, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of those paintings, you know, they were of Negro Leaguers, you know, Cuban Leaguers, uh, Dominican Republic, Mexican, like, all of all of these other leagues that so many baseball fans don't necessarily know anything about. And I didn't, you know, I didn't really know a ton about them either. Uh, you know, growing up, it's kind of like I, I knew who Satchel Page was. I knew who Josh Gibson was. Um, but, you know, I, it's like that's kind of that was kind of the end of, of where I knew uh, these guys. So, like, finding out about these players and, you know, the rich history that, you know, that were in the Negro leagues and that were in the Latin American leagues, like just finding out how long baseball has been played in, in, in Cuba, like it's, it's amazing. And, you know, I, it's like, it's not so much like having more of an appreciation for a specific player, but learning more about that player and where kind of he or she has been. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, knowing that Josh Gibson you know, would play in like the Puerto Rican winter league, you know, with, with Santorsi and, you know, knowing that he did that, like not only obviously to make money or whatever, but it's kind of like he gets to escape the prejudices here in the States and go to a place where he's basically worshiped as a God. Um, You know, same with like Clemente, you know, I, I love painting Clemente in, in like a Pittsburgh uniform or whatever, but, you know, like, doing him in like a Centurcy uniform, like mm. that turns me on. That's, that's the fun stuff. I mean, that's just like, that's like the real inside baseball stuff. Like, I feel like you get to know these players in a way, like it sounds corny, but you get to know them kind of in an intimate way when you're kind of going throughout their entire career and learning about these different places that they played in. Not at all, man. It's the, that's the beauty of it, man. That's like that's the same thing as like a pitcher sitting there studying his batter, studying his batter, so he knows in the top of the seventh inning that when I got a runner on second, I can just throw this and I can get you out with it. You yeah. know how Clemente smirks. You know how the tooth goes up. I love the one when you did the Crabbers where you got Jocelyn back laughing and everything like that. I was going to say, I think the only jersey I think you haven't painted Josh Gibson in. Is this correct? Hold on. Uh, the pinstripe grays that you haven't i don't think i don't think I don't, i'm not sure i think no one. i i haven't done i haven't done that specific year mm-hmm. um i've painted them in the grays jersey i think like maybe two oh, grays jersey yeah but but the, they weren't pinstriped ones yeah um i think that one what is that like a 39 or Correct. something That's yeah right. i i haven't done that one but uh oh man josh is great just just a, just a magnitude we could go we could walk down all of the ball, like, and the ones my father loves are the the actual old ones, like mm. the, old, the old of like you know the red stockings and everything like that. When it was like the, the right after the Civil War, the way they used to sit, like the picnic setting type thing and everything yeah. like that. That was great. Now another one that I must give you 
major pop song. Give me one second. I'm going to throw this jersey up. So maybe, hopefully, it'll ring your mind and your memory real quick. Okay. <laughs> this one, though. Aww. When you did the Hank, when the Hank was looking up at the God smiling, man. I said, I said, right there, you're a genius on that, man. And, oh, man. <laughs> And we love you. Thank you. And we definitely, we definitely love you. And we definitely want to say thank you for your time. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, do, let me ask you this one. Any big paintings you got going on right now that we can know of? If not, I understand. Oh, hey, I understand. No, I, I can, I can tell you about a lot of them. Um, I wish I could show them to you. They're, they're a little tough to like move around, but uh, so like I've got, I've got this large panoramic that I'm starting soon of uh, just kind of a, a, a baseball scene from uh, from I think 1884 from this Ohio team. Uh, there's no one like special in it, but it just kind of like shows the game as it was played in that era. Um, I've got uh, a large uh, Jackie Robinson. I'm going to be starting semi soon. A large uh, a large Gehrig, uh, a large Clemente, a lot of a lot of guys and a lot of like a lot of other ones that I, I have to finish stuff. That's kind of like in progress. Uh, some of whom are more obscure, like Negro leaguers. So I, I absolutely love it. Like I'm doing this one of, uh, of Pete Hill, who is one of my favorite Negro leaguers who I absolutely love. And, and the buyer is like super excited for it. So I'm even more excited that, you know, Great. someone wants to pay for it. But uh, the fact that I get to paint him is fantastic. Um, you know, I got like a, a mini Minoso painting. It's like, it, it doesn't end like, thankfully, um, thankfully I'm, I'm very busy, but I, I'm even more thankful for the fact that I don't, you know, knock on wood. I don't ever seem to run into like any artist block. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's always, there's always something to, to draw from pardon the pun. It's just, there's so much history you know, it's like the best visually documented sport, you know, in, in our history. And there's so many interesting subjects for so many interesting reasons. And it's, I feel like I'm going to be bouncing around forever, hopefully, you know, until I'm, until I'm gone. And I, I know for sure that, you know, on my deathbed or whatever, I'm just going to be thinking about all the stuff that I, that I wish I had the time to paint. I mean, you know, among all the other stuff that i think I should be thinking about on my deathbed <laughs> talking about, man, I think I, I could have, if I would have spent three more hours, I'd have been done this one painting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, but that's a good thing. But once again, it is what, like you said, it's no other sport embodies the relationship between generations and communities, man. Like yeah. really, and really, it's great to see everything. Great to, to talk to you, to see the, per, the personality behind the paintings. Um, and it's true and it's true. And you can see your passion for it. And, and I hope you just, I hope you just continuously make masterpieces. Oh man. Do you feel like that though? Do you feel like when you make them, do you look at it and just be like, that's a masterpiece right there? Never. <laughs> you always Never. critique it, right? You always critique yeah. it. And I could have done this. I could have done that. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you were saying before you're in the music business. So it's like, I hate everything I ever did. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can, I can finish with something and be like, okay, that's finished. And in the back of my head, I know that it can be better. I don't necessarily know how, like it's some like next level stuff like that I'm not privy to yet, Good. but it's kind of like, I know it's not perfect. And even, even like, as I get older and, you know, I kind of develop and maybe improve or whatever, it's kind of like you, you solve one problem and then it's like the Hydra, you know, you solve a problem and then all of a sudden you discover two more. Mm -hmm. you know, coming up in, in its place because you now have a greater understanding of it. So it's like, you keep reaching for the bar and the bar keeps going higher. And, you know, it's always like, I'll get there. I'll get there. Eventually. I think I'll get there. I almost get it. But in the end, you know, it's like, I never get it. Never get it. It's motivation. It's good. Now, let me, I, I know I told you once again, I told you I'm Greek. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to let you go five times. And I'm never going to let you go and then try to give you baklava. But the, the, <laughs> Who, who, if I can ask, you don't have to answer. Sure. Who is your most high profile non sports person that acquired to you for you to paint a painting for them? Does that make sense? So obviously the, the, the person, the high stature, like if it was Obama, something like that, I'm just saying like someone no outside of this house. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty, as you said, you want me to set the bar high. So <laughs> that's a high bar. bar. Yeah. Um, okay. So, 
the highest profile guy. Okay. Disclaimer so, doesn't have to be one again. I'm sorry. I'm, I know I say the one all the time. No, 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 no worries. Um, so, okay. So the one who I think, let's say the one who has, you know, quote unquote, the most power mm-hmm. um, is a guy by the name of uh, Thomas Tull. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Tull used to own uh, Legendary Pictures, which was the production company that made, you know, the Batman movies, uh, kind of like brought comic book movies back into, Mm -hmm. I guess, the limelight. Uh, He no longer owns them. I think he kind of does some other stuff now. Uh, He's he's very wealthy and he really likes, uh, you know, baseball memorabilia. So he's like a very big collector of that stuff. And um he, he likes my work, which is amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I actually have to do a commission for him, uh, in the next like year or two. Uh, but it's weird. Cause like every time I talk to him, it's like, first I have to talk to like a secretary who has to like, get me to like another secretary who has to get me to him. You know, it's like, this guy is like, you know, no. important or, or whatever. Um, so he's probably, he's probably the biggest, uh, you know, like the highest. Oh, and then, that's got to be a great feeling too. Like you said, like, you know, a person that's well off and wealthy can go pick anybody in the world, but you choose me, you know, to come, to come pick me and, and, and deal with me. So that's kudos to you again, man. That, that's, that's oh, great. Thank you. I mean, it feels good, but I also, it also like, I question their sanity because I mean, you know, Thomas is a very nice guy and, you know, I love talking with him and I so appreciate that he loves my work, but it's still, I'm looking at my work through my own eyes. So I'm like, can't you see what I see? Like, can't you see that this could be better? I don't know how it could be better, but it could be better. Uh, but I they don't, like, yeah. they don't see it. Like, like whatever you say, Greg, just answer the phone call. When I need to <laughs> That's right. Me. That's what I need you to do yeah. right now. So. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, whatever. No, I'm also, great, That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm also really neurotic. So there's that, which I'm sure, you know, you can kind of gauge by this conversation. <laughs> oh, but that's a good thing though. At the, I mean, once again, you're on your own back, you're pushing yourself to be better. That's what we need a lot in this world. I mean, this is just personal opinions, but we do need more people like yourself to set a standard high and say, it's, it's not okay to settle. We got to push ourselves. We got to push ourselves to be better because if you never push yourself, sir, <laughs> we might not even have in this conversation. If I never push myself, yeah. the same thing, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, who is your biggest client that you had that was a sports athlete? Uh, to be honest, I actually, uh, I don't actually know if any professional athlete has any of my work. Um, I, I, unless I'm, unless like there's a glaring one that I can't think of, but I, I think like 90, you know, 99.9% of the stuff I do is like goes to people who are not professional athletes. Um, that's even better if you ask me. That's yeah. Even, that's even more of a beauty to it because it's just looking at it and just saying, this is way more than what meets the eye. So. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I hope, I hope you're right. I, you know, sometimes I think like, God, I wish I could get this work in front of, uh, you know, so-and-so player or whatever, but, uh, it, you know, it's all good, I guess, because I, it, I, I seem to be doing okay. It's just, uh, uh, you know, sometimes there's like, you know, in the art world, there's kind of like a, there's a, uh, I don't want to say like street cred, but it's almost like it is some sort of like social currency that comes with, you know, having your work in the collection of well-known people. And obviously, you know, who's better known than star athletes? You know, it's like everybody knows who these people are. Um, so, you know, maybe someday, but it's, even if it never happens, it's fine. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, not to say it like that, like I'm some weirdo, but definitely from going on social media, different things like that, you know, I follow you on social media, just seeing the comments and how people will literally go under something you posted and we'll talk about the feeling that they have about it. Not even talk about the game, not even talk about the person, not even talk about anything, but it all be related to that era. Like you painted something. I think it was like a Honus painting or something. And someone was going, yeah, my great, great grandfather used to pass down stories about this and about that and about that. And I'm, and I was like, 
That's what it is. That's what it's about. There it is. There you got yeah. it. You got it right there. Yeah. So, that, yeah. If, if someone, if someone looks at a painting and, you know, they say, oh, that, you know, that really looks like Mickey Mantle or whatever, you know, I, I appreciate that. And, and that's, that's awesome. But if someone says something like, wow, you know, it's like you nailed what Yankee stadium looks like, you know, on a hot summer day, you know, it's like, I can smell, I can smell the cigar smoke coming from the stands. I can smell the popcorn. I can, I can hear the, you know, the, the buzz of the crowd. Like that's, that's power. That's and I, like, and I saw in one of your, uh, your um, earlier interviews, that's what you said too. You, you hope that your paintings bring the same feeling, the smells, the excitements that you had when you were a child with your father walking in and seeing the ball game. So yeah, that's mission accomplished on that. On Yeah. On, well, on it's going to be weird if like, you know, I, I don't know how old you are. I, I, but 38. I'm out 38 years old, 38. Okay. So I'm, I'm 41. And I guess, uh, you know, I grew up watching the Yankees in the eighties or whatever, and going to the ballpark and seeing, you know, the Don Mattingly's and Winfield's and Ricky Henderson's and whatnot. And it's like <laughs> my memories of, of Yankee stadium from that area or from that era were, uh, were of, you know, like being in the concourse and being in the grandstands and, you know, watching people cup cigarettes so I can smell the smoke <laughs> and you can smell the urine, you know, the urine coming from the good old New York city, man. Yeah. You so it's like, does my painting make you think of urine and cigarette, cigarette smoke? <laughs> but that could have been someone's best times, man. I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, so that was time with their family and they spent and you captured that and you brought that and you, and you did that. So it's all about, I'm going to give you the gambit before we get up out of here real quick. Sure. Now we talked about favorite baseball teams growing up and everything like that. Your favorite baseball Jersey that you own your favorite. This could have been something that you had when you were eight years old, or when you are right now. Oh man. Jeez. You know what? To be honest, I'm going to sound like such a freaking loser here. I actually don't, uh, I don't think I've ever owned any baseball jerseys. Because most of the jerseys I owned when I was younger, uh, they were basketball jerseys. We can do basketball as well. That's just, that's, that's a beautiful okay. thing. Awesome. Okay. Um, Personally, I got the Larry Bird because of December 7th, you know, we got the same birthday. So oh, okay. it's got to so be the Ice Water Man Larry Bird. And he talks about an amazing okay. amount of trash. So, well, all right. So I was a long, I was a long suffering uh, Nick fan. I guess awesome. I still am. Um, <laughs> but my favorite <laughs> my favorite jersey which i thought was so cool that no one would ever care about um was that i don't know if you remember uh sean respert who used mm -hmm. to play for uh, michigan state uh I, you know he had like a cup of coffee uh, you know in uh, in the nba but you know in college the man was incredible he could shoot like nobody's business and i was so excited for him to come into the nba i thought it was gonna be lights out and uh for my birthday one year my uh my parents got me like you know a nice official sean respert michigan state jersey yes. uh and i still have it uh and i <laughs> i remember wearing it once and like no one absolutely no one knew who the hell it was because you know there's no you. name on the back yeah thought it yeah, was like, it's like, you don't know about Sean Rasford. You don't know about this guy. <laughs> They're like, you're absolutely right. We have no clue. We have no, we have no clue what's going on. You're trying to pull yeah. up game tape on YouTube. Like, no, check him out. He's great, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, so you're a big college basketball guy then, huh? I, I mean, I was, but I haven't. Uh, it's like my love of basketball has kind of, it hasn't, it hasn't gone on as I've gotten older. I feel like it's kind of just stayed in you know, the late eighties and the nineties and the very early two thousands. So in my head, you know, in my head, the Knicks still have like Charlie Ward, you know, and like yeah. Patrick Ewing just retired. <laughs> yeah. Starks is still getting ready to come out and fight. Yeah, fight, fight, it, exactly. But it, no, I, but it, that was great. Sad. Hey man, we, we grew up with Jordan and, and stuff I like know. that. It's kind of hard to literally, it, it is what it, I don't want to start anything about with LeBron and Kobe, <laughs> but so that, that's really what it was. It's going to be, it was about the jerseys. Um, it, what, the last thing I will ask you, do you do a lot of history study when you do the paint, like on, on the actual like uniforms and everything like that? Like, will yeah. you really go look at the blends? You'll go. Yeah. See, yeah. yeah it, I mean, you know, as I think, I, I think I told you off mic uh, before that, you know, especially with like the Negro league stuff, it's very hard, but, uh, but there's a lot of really great record keeping for, uh, for the, you know, the regular major league stuff. Uh and you can get like into the serious minutia, like especially with, with you know, like the Yankee jerseys from, uh, 
let's say like the Yankee jersey from 1941, like the width of the pinstripes and, and the size of the interlocking NY compared to what uh, what the same features look like in like a 1939 jersey compared to a 1936 jersey, uh, you know, down to uh, down to the stitching, how that was done, how the you know the sleeves were were cut. Uh, it I, I try to be like super uh, super exact with that. Like with each season, you know, you got to kind of be conscious of of how of how that changes. Um, it's it's hard and it, it's kind of it, it's kind of maddening. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah but it, that, what's yeah. good is that you know there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, Mark Okenin's research about baseball jerseys or, you know, like the dress to the nines hall of fame, uh, thing, um, or even just, you know, newspaper articles <clears throat> that, uh, that, you know, at the beginning of every year, they might just say, you know, Oh, you know, the New York giants are sporting their new, you know, home whites, you know, that have black trim and black socks and black hat, you know, stuff like that. That's like, that stuff is gold to me. So, yeah, I'm, I, I'm always, you know, I try to be as, like, historically accurate as possible, even if it's stuff that's 150 years ago that no one's going to call me out on. Because, you know, as you know, baseball fans are super anal mm -hmm. uh, about everything. I mean, especially about stats and whatnot. But uh, certainly, you know, the look of the jerseys, like, that's that's another part of it. So major. yeah, that's major. That's another part. That's like one of the five. It's like the baseball is like the mafia conglomerate. And there's like the five fingers of the different ones. <laughs> right. The uniforms is definitely like the Lucchese family, man. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, but this is great. Been talking with you and everything like that. And I really appreciate your time. Um, it's a great thing that you do, man. Your, your, you. your stuff is, you know, as music, they say it's a, a work of art, you know, it's, it's poetry and motion and everything like that. And yours is, is, is the same. You can see through this whole interview, I've been staring at the Babe Ruth in the back, trying to see if he's going to wipe the dirt off his pants. Like, Oh man, you know, thank so. you. I appreciate so, it. Once again, Mr. Greg, we appreciate your time. Hope your voice gets better, man. We appreciate oh, thank the you. whole interview and everything like that. And, um, if you guys haven't checked them out, make sure you guys check them out. Make sure you guys uh, chip in and let's all put together and get a nice painting from Mr. Greg. Mr. Greg, we appreciate you again. <laughs> and we will talk to you soon, sir. Thanks, buddy. Thank you for having me. Adios. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll definitely go through. I'm going to do some recording. I go to Puerto Rico. I, well, I'm actually leaving on the 16th. I'm going to go to uh, Greenville. I'm going to go okay. meet Mr. Dan at the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum. I oh, Dan, uh, Dan Wallach. Yeah. Yeah. I got uh, a nice spinner Jersey and everything like that. And I'm going to wear down there. Shoe oh, I'll say hi to him for me. He's a, yes, he's a good friend of mine. Yes, sir. I was going to bring that up, but I wanted to, I wanted to name drop you. Not like name drop you, but say that we spoke about something while we were there. Plus I didn't want to overstep anything that I know he's been doing a lot of renovations there too, as well. And yeah. uh, it's beautiful, man. Like the old era of the game, like knowing that this guy worked in the steel mill came off, you know, he's batting in a dead ball era. He can hit the ball 400 some feet. No one cares about. It's just the history of the game. And, and that's really what I, I love the most about you is just like you said, like the attention to the detail. If you look at some of your paintings, you can actually see faces of people inside of the crowds that I saw on one of your videos that you look at to try to study to make sure. And that's just the beauty. I really respect your passion. Man, and, I, and I hope it came through. I hope I didn't cut you off. I hope I didn't no. say anything disrespectful, man. And, and I no, totally man. appreciate your time. So no, you were great, Matt. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you having me on. And I'm, I'm, I'm jealous that you're going to go, uh, that you're going to see Dan. Cause I, I haven't seen him in, I haven't seen him since like a year and a half ago, like right before the pandemic happened. Um, He's such a good dude, though. No, I see it. him and I. It, it was funny when we were talking. You know, he used to do music. I used to do music. Like, I, there's a lot of things we have in common. So that should be a cool little meet. And I know that we're gonna go see like the liquor store, the old ballpark. You know, take me around awesome. and everything. I'm taking my father. My father, he, he's the one that introduced me in the bit. Literally, when I was five years old, I used to hear stories of Manny Sanguin and. Uh, Roberto Clemente. Fast forward 33 years later, I'm taking my dad out for his 75th birthday with Manny Sanguin and oh. hanging out talking about Clemente stories. So the great thing for him is he would always talk about the Georgia Peach. He would always tell me about how the best baseball player was also the smartest, about how he invested, about how he used his money, about how the man couldn't read and write at a time, but he taught himself to. And he also opened up schools so other kids could tease. Right. It's just really the passing down of the information. So long story short, I'm picking him up. Hopefully we'll stop by Royston as well on our little trip. We'll nice. go up and come back down to Florida and Orlando. But that's amazing, man. You so your dad, your dad's a Pittsburgh fan. And yeah. you did he like 
did he give you shit because you were a Baltimore kid? Uh, no, not really. He would always just, you know, call me a piece of shit and call me my mother's child. So, no, I, you know, bust my balls and everything. Right. Like <laughs> um, I was, I always grew up though. I would have to say, I always grew up after my father. I used to love to go when we went to, so my mother's side, they lived in Baltimore. They came from New York. They were down here. My uh -huh. grandfather was a gambling Greek. He loved Boog Pal. That was his man. That was his guy, everything. That's so awesome. they would never talk during the seasons. They would never talk, but I would always Pittsburgh. I love the black and gold. I love the gritty yeah. play. Bobby Bonilla, Andy Van Slyke, Jay oh, Bell, yeah. Bell back on the, on the mound. That was just it was the gritty team and it was, yeah, the, that was a great it was, team. It was, it was the gritty team. And then going on with, you know, Barry Bonds. I used to love that. I used to actually own a pair of MIM bands. I don't know if you uh, know who MIMS is, but yes. I used to own the MIMS bands. And then now where I'm looking for, and then come f forward 30 something years, I'm getting ready to literally release my oh. very own baseball with Brock MIMS bands. And that is awesome. We're just going to we're just going to sell them to raise money. I, I have a, a orphanage in Puerto Rico and we have a, a school in Puerto Rico that I go to. We just literally pack up suitcases, go down there, uh, pay our respects to Clemente, drop stuff off and keep it going. Man. That's yeah. awesome. And you got to you got to let me know when you uh, when you do that so I can uh, so I can help out. Awesome. <clears throat> just keep doing what you're doing because like i said i, I to, to go on there you know uh social media is such as the just a just a show your ass type of place and everything like that and to, and to see people like yourself that just really just place things so people can enjoy it it's different besides saying hey look what i've done let me brag on you you know excuse my language look at this asshole i get ten thousand for this or whatever right um, it's very humbling it's very hey what do you guys think hey i really appreciate it. the way you even responded to me a couple of times oh thank you very much matt oh this that and the third and it was just like this this gentleman deserves all this flowers now because oh man well i appreciate it i just you know i honestly i, I just really appreciate people who, you know vibing with what i do in some way and <clears throat> and wanting to talk to me that's that's awesome. That makes me happy. That makes me feel like I'm doing something right. Well, you, you definitely are, brother. And keep, keep <laughs> on living up the, the past, man. Keep on doing that and keep on just bringing those vivid pictures. Because like you say, I'm a, I'm a rapper, man. I can say a thousand words and probably half of them don't mean shit. But a great painting does mean a thousand words and they can talk and go on for a thousand years. Because look at the hieroglyphs. I'm Greek, so I've always taught that. You know, they say, oh, a poet, they'll say something and it'll last for a hundred years and then it gets misconstrued. But the painting... The painting lasts forever. So on that note, Mr. Greg, you have it's a true. great night. It was great talking to you. And 